Well, thank you. Thank you for, for, for the opportunity. I, I love this venue. It's great to talk at it, you know, and uh, I'm so thankful that I'm up here able to tell you good news because I don't know what I would have done <laughs> otherwise. So, uh, but it, 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 you know, all, all's going well. You know, it, uh, it, it's pretty exciting to, to go through the, the launch of, of Tron Zero. You see we, we have these uh, SCA commemorative coins here, well, the lapel pins. This is the Tron Zero Launch 1 lapel pin. And you notice it's, uh, I, when I first looked at it, I said, well, I, you know, that's kind of a, a big lapel pin. And, and uh, it's pointed out to me, this is a big deal. <laughs> I'm like, okay. You know, you're right. It is a big deal. So, there we go. so no, it's, it's, it's exciting. And, and thank you for the opportunity here. And it, it was, you know, it's been, uh, SDA has been a, an agency for, for four years. And, uh, and we just received our funding just over three years ago, so it's pretty impressive. I will, will tell you that we went from orbit to launch. The number I give you is going to be a little bit different than what, the, what uh, General Saltzman gave you today, and I'll explain the difference so you don't think that we're making up numbers. So I, I say we made orbit to launch in, in just over 30 months. That's, uh, that's accounting for when the, when the transport contract was let to when the transport satellites were, were put on orbit from the, from the York Constellation. If you look at, uh, if you look at uh, what uh, General Saltzman says, he'll, he'll say it's 27 months. He's counting from when SpaceX tracking was actually put on contract, and then there was the protest, and then to, to, to launch. So that actually is 27 months from, from, from order to orbit. So that's pretty impressive. But I, I'll, I'll stick with the, with the more conservative value and say, say 30. So that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're going with. I think there's, there's pictures up here. There's told, but I, oh, on the screens there, you see it. So um, that is, if it's, a, if it's a picture, I think it is. It's a shipping crate with a, with a satellite being put in it. Those are the York satellites being put in a shipping crate. And then the beautiful thing, obviously, we have to show the, the beauty, though, on the, on the, next, the next picture. So then we have the rocket that it was launched on. So I'll talk a little bit about that and about what we have, have coming up. And I'll, I'll be, you know, perfectly honest, this was so exciting that uh, since, since they launched on Sunday... Uh, then we, we've, been, we've been going through test and checkout. I am pleased to announce that we have, we have communications, du full duplex communications with all 10 satellites. So that's pretty amazing. We actually got uh, communications within, within, uh, within 12 hours for 9 out of the 10, and then took us a little longer to, to find the 10th the one. But we found it. We have full, full duplex comms, so all's going through there. We're going through debugging and test and checkout, and obviously we'll be doing that for the next several weeks. So, of course, that was a, a beautiful launch, and I think there's a nighttime picture of the rocket on the, the next one. So that was taken the night right before the first launch attempt. So I uh, flew out for that launch on – it was uh, it was to go out on Thursday morning. It did not. There was, uh, you know, there was a, basically a, an, a, a reading that, uh, that was a little out of spec at T minus three seconds, and so it was autonomously aborted to say, okay, we need to check this out before we go forward. And then, uh, you know, the launch finally then eventually went perfectly on, on Sunday. But it's kind of a, a running joke at the Space Development Agency now. So this is our first launch where we had a uh, first launch of what we call the Proliferated Warfighter Space Architecture. And it's the first launch that was solely dedicated to SDA. Everything on board that rocket was SDA. But it's not the first time we actually put something in orbit. So we went up on, on Transporter 2 where we, had, where we had five experiments that went up on that mission. And again, it was the same thing. So I flew out for that, uh, for that launch out of the Cape, went down there all excited, and uh, T minus 12 seconds at that point it was aborted. It was a range foul. Somebody flew a helicopter into the range, and so they aborted it. And so I, I left. I had to fly back uh, to get back to the Pentagon, and my deputy stayed and, and, uh, and launched the rocket. So this time, it's, uh, it was interesting. So I went out there. We had, uh, you know, the, the, the press conference and the fanfare the day before, and uh, my deputy did not go out because we are in the middle of getting ready for our Tranche 2 transport solicitations, which I'll talk about a little bit. But he had to stay back because mission takes priority, so he stood back to make sure that we could get that solicitation out. Semper Sidious, we're not messing around. So he stood, stayed back and said, you know, I really wish I could be there for the launch, but, I, I, you know, I just need to stay and finish this up. So I said, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So he, he didn't get to see the, the Thursday launch attempt. But then I flew back Friday afternoon because I had to get back, and he flew out Saturday morning, and he actually saw the launch go on on Sunday. And he says, you know, I don't think we're going to invite you to the launch anymore is what he told me. And, and so, uh, yeah, it's probably, probably not, but it was funny. He came out 
you guys have been messing around. Let's launch this thing. And he got it done. So that's exciting. So it was, uh, you know, it was a beautiful Palm Sunday launch. And uh, we're pretty excited now to have that. So what, what that means, there were 10 satellites on there, eight transport satellites uh, that will be able, those, those eight satellites are all from, from York Space Systems. They'll be able to demonstrate the mesh network. They'll be able to demonstrate the Link 16 from space. First time that'll ever be demonstrated. They'll be able to, to demonstrate that we can tie the tracking satellites, which are missile tracking, and transport together. So two of the 10 then were the tracking satellites by SpaceX. And so they'll, uh, you know, they're going through test and checkout. We hope that they start entering calibration on the wide field of view infrared sensor in May, be able to pass those data onto the transport satellites so we can demonstrate that we, we completely close that kill chain. Then in June, we have the second launch. So the tranche zero is made up of 28 total satellites. So in June, we'll launch the remainder uh, with, the, with the remaining uh, 10 Lockheed transport satellites and two York transport satellites. And then we've got two more SpaceX tracking and four more L3 Harris tracking satellites that make up the entire tranche zero. What the whole idea is that will demonstrate that we can form a mesh network with multiple vendors. We can take those tactical data, get them directly down to theater, and we can do advanced missile detection of targets that, that uh, we don't typically see and track and form targeting solutions on and demonstrate that entire thing. Now that is, that is demonstration. The whole idea we actually call Tranche Zero or our, our Warfighter Immersion Tranche. The idea is that will allow us to participate in exercises so that we can develop con ops and techniques and procedures so that when we launch the real Tranche One, which is our first operational tranche, we can turn those data quickly and turn that into an operational capability and the warfighters have already been training on it. So we're actually only 18 months away from our first Tranche One launch, which is, which is pretty exciting. So Tranche One has about 150 satellites on it to be able to do the, the missile warning, missile tracking, and that tactical data link uh, connectivity. That starts to launch next September, and then we essentially have, we have 12 launches, and uh, they'll probably be about a month apart, so we'll have, we'll have basically launch one a month for, for the next year on Tranche One. Pretty excited about that. So where we are on that program, the, uh, the, the Tranche One transport satellites will all go through their critical design review by the end of this month, and, uh, and then at that point we'll be in build on those, and then uh, we'll be in build and then uh, assembly integration and test and just continue to push forward until we get, uh, until we get to that launch. The tracking satellites are uh, just following right behind that, so they go through their critical design review a little later. So that's the whole idea, and that's the concept, and that's, that's, that's pretty profound, and we're pushing pretty quickly on that. Tranche 2 is what's next, right? So Tranche 1, Tranche 2. Tranche 2 is going to build up on what we've done on Tranche 1 to essentially make the entire architecture globally persistent. So for Tranche 1, we have regional persistence. You might say, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. The satellites orbit the Earth, they go around the whole Earth, they don't hover. Satellites don't hover, especially in LEO, but what they do do is, so with, since uh, we don't have enough satellites, we, we power cycle the, uh, the, the, the satellites. We have to have a duty cycle. So if I want to concentrate uh, at this time over the Indo-PACOM region, I power on my satellites so that they can transmit while they're over Indo-PACOM and then they charge their battery up the rest of the orbit, kind of do those kind of things. So that's when, when I talk about persistence over a region, that's what I'm talking about. And we can shift that on the fly. There's no reason, you know, we don't have to make that decision prior to launch. Tranche 2 will have enough satellites up there to where we can do that duty cycling amongst the satellites, but then we'll still have global persistence anywhere we want. So we don't have to start to, we don't have to really, really make those trades. So Tranche 2 uh, is broken up, in, the transport is broken up into three different instantiations. So we have a Tranche uh, 2 transport layer alpha, beta, and gamma solicitation that's going to be going on on the street. And just to make sure that uh, we, we confuse you sufficiently, beta is going to come out before alpha because that's, that's how the Greek alphabet works in Kansas, so that's the way we're rolling it. So, and uh, beta is, is uh, so this actually, we expect this to, to go out and be live next week, sometime next week. It will be very similar to what was our TIDES uh, satellites, which was our Tranche 1 developmental and experimentation satellites, which we have 12 of those that are being built right now. So these are what we call our TAC SATCOM satellites. So they'll have the LaserCom crosslinks to be able to talk to, to uh, the rest of the constellation. Uh, but instead of having Link 16, 
they'll have a tax satcom payload, the UHF S-band tax satcom payload, to go down to, to tactical users. And so we'll, we'll be going out with that solicitation, and you'll see that uh, pretty early on. And then uh, as, soon as, as soon as you all turn in your proposals for beta, we're going to go into source selection, but we're not going to give you a chance to rest while we're doing source selection. We're going to then release our alpha solicitation. Alpha is going to be very similar to our tranche one transport layer baseline, meaning that it'll have the optical crosslinks, it'll have the KA, it'll have the onboard battle management processing, and it'll have the Link 16 payload. That's the, that's the ma main mission payload for, for alpha is the Link 16 payload. So you'll see that come out basically as, as soon as the uh, beta proposals are due. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll go out with uh, probably tracking, tranche two tracking will go out after alpha. And so that will be for the next version of our wide field of view constellation to build that out uh, and, and continue to be able to do that for the advanced missile warning, missile tracking, so that we can provide those data to the warfighter. And then gamma, transport layer gamma will come out then uh, later after, after tracking. So now we're in, you know, we're in the really late, uh, uh, really, really late uh, in the year or early next year is when tranche two gamma will come out, and that will look a lot like beta, except it'll have advanced waveforms on there. We're working with we're working with some mission partners to develop advanced waveforms, uh, so that that'll be a requirement on the uh, on the gamma solicitation. So we're all we're, you know that that's pretty exciting. We've got that going on. There's also there's also some activity that we're doing on uh, on our, our our battle management side with our applications. A lot, of those, a lot of those solicitations are, have closed. We're in source selection on those now as far as what will be our, our application factory uh, to be able to build out these new applications. And so then you'll start to see some solicitations for specific apps, meaning so some specific mission capabilities that would be hosted on board the battle management processors on the, on the satellites. So some of those will be track data fusion for missile warning, uh, different kind of, of communication, networking, those kind of applications will have several solicitations going out, and we'll also look for industry to provide us feedback on what uh, what you think you could do with that BMCQ processor, and and then we'll we'll take that under advisement as we as we go forward on those. So that's what we've got looking for, looking uh, as going forward. Now, one of the one of the things when uh, when I gave this talk last time, so it was right as we were transferring into the Space Force. And so the question is, did that, has that, has that worked out okay? And I, I just will point to the success of, of what we've done on, on Tranche Zero with the launch, how well we're pushing forward on Tranche One. Uh, we've gotten a, a lot of support from the Space Force. The Space Force is 100% is behind us on, on helping us be successful for this new proliferated architecture. This is the way of the future for the Space Force, looking at, at the, the two pillars that we are holding up. Pillar number one is proliferation, hundreds and hundreds of satellites to be able to provide these missions. And number two, the spiral development. We've got to get out of this model of where we do acquisition and it takes us 10 years to develop a program, and then uh, we, we fly the program for 15 years. The Department and the Space Force is leading that way now, saying, no, we are, we are completely behind this model where we, we, do, we do rapid Rapid prototyping and fielding, we operate that for a limited lifetime, say five years, and we continue to build that up. That's the model. We've gotten a lot of support, and if anything, this, this launch has done, it has shown that it is a feasible model. One can actually build and launch these satellites on the time frames that we've proposed. We'll show that again here in June, and we'll continue to show that as we build out in Field Tranche 1, which will allow us to be able to bring the capability directly to the warfighter to support a fight in 2025. And so that's what, that's what we're excited about. We'll continue to push forward with this. Uh, we'll continue to follow the way this is, this is enabled is by using Secretary Calvelli's tenants, which if you, if you read those tenants, they essentially codify everything SDA is doing, so you can tell we have a lot of support there. So I'm excited. I'm excited to, to continue to push this. Uh, we'll continue to have press releases out as we, we hit those milestones through, through test and checkout of Tranche Zero. And keep your eyes open for our Tranche 2 solicitations because we've got a lot of things pushing forward on that. And uh, now I'll open it up and give you guys plenty of time for, for questions. Thank you. All right. Any questions? Uh, I can't see people behind the lights. so hard to see. Oh, I see you. Teresa. Teresa Hitchens, breaking defense, everybody. Now, again, round of applause. 
Sure. Sorry. Um, I have a question about how the wide field of view sensor uh, payload, those satellites, are, gonna, is, are going to integrate with the HT, HBT, I can't ever remember. HBTSS. That one. Um, for, for the Missile Defense Agency. And sensor. can you talk about how they are going to work together? And maybe how, I, I take it they have slightly different missions. So yes. if you could explain that, that would be great. Thanks. Sure, sure. No, thank you. This is... Uh, this is really important, so I'll, I'll take some time to, to clarify all of this. So HBTSS is, uh, is a sensor that is designed to have sensitivity that's, uh, that's better than our wide field of view system, and it also has resolution, spatial resolution, that, that's better. The whole idea behind HBTSS is that it will uh, allow you to actually calculate a fire control solution, meaning a solution that you could, you could launch an interceptor on remote, from the data feeds from that sensor and be able to, to intercept and, and take it out. The, uh, what, the, what the HBTS sensor needs in order to do that mission, uh, because I, I call that a medium field of view sensor, because it has, it's designed to have global access, meaning that it should be able to see the entire globe if you tell it where to look on the globe. It doesn't have global coverage. The wide field of view sensor, which is what we're flying right now on, on Tranche Zero, is a, is a sensor that has sensitivity to, to detect these hypersonic glide vehicles, but it's full global coverage. So, you know, the constellation sees the entire globe at all times. You know, the, the unblinking eye as if you, uh, is what, uh, what they always uh, used to say. So we'll be able to detect it, track it, be able to say where that, uh, where, essentially where that hypersonic glide vehicle is going but we may or may not be able to actually give a uh, tight enough solution on its position so that you could launch an interceptor or engage an interceptor purely off of what we detect. That's where the medium field of view sensor, which HBTSS is the, is, is the design uh, for the medium field of view sensor, that's where it comes in. So the wide field of view sensor will tell the medium field of view sensor exactly where to look. It will look and give you a fire control solution send that back to the transport layer, and transport layer will then send that down to, you know, to a, to, a, to a weapon system. So that could be down directly to an Aegis ship so that it could launch on remote. So the, uh, the way we're, we're kind of playing these out, Tranche Zero is going to launch eight of the wide field of view systems to demonstrate that out and, and prove that technology. HBTSS, the MDA HBTSS system, is going to launch two satellites that uh, are demonstrating the medium field of view capabilities, and they'll, they'll launch that later this year. And then on tranche one, when we go operational, we are going to, we SCA are going to have 35 wide field of view systems in operation and working, and we SDA are going to have four satellites that are flying medium field of view sensors that are essentially the HBTSS sensor, the copies of those sensors. We're going to build four of those and fly those to demonstrate in an operational system how one would employ the wide field of view, tipping the medium field of view, feeding all those data to the transport layer and sending that down to the, to the warfighter. So that's how all that's working. And up till now, you know, the, uh, the, the wide field of view and the medium field of view or the, the SDA and the MDA teams have been in, uh, in close collaboration. In fact, HBTSS had a Phase 2A program and a Phase 2B. Phase 2B is what they're doing now. That's actually building the flight unit. Phase 2A demonstrated the signal chain processing demo, which was a flight-like hardware that took photons in a synthetic scene in, went through onboard processing, and, and, and uh, pulled out a, a two-dimensional missile track out of this scene. That's critical, and we're actually taking those algorithms and flying those both on HBTSS and on, uh, on the, our wide field of view tranche zero tracking satellites. That's so critical because there are so many people that don't believe that we'll be able to do that mission from low Earth orbit in, 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 a, in a manner that, that we can do that all on board. And the reason being is historically it was done from higher orbits, geosynchronous or highly elliptical orbits, and so the background looks significantly different because your, your satellite has much larger pixels and it's moving much slower relative to the, to the background of the Earth. So it's easy to pull out the background. When you're at LEO, it's actually difficult to do because the background is changing so quickly because you're moving over the globe so quickly, you know, you're, you're closer to the, to, to the Earth. 
And so HBTSS has demonstrated all that as part of their phase 2.0 with flight-like hardware. That's what gives us the confidence to move forward. So I'll say that you know, we, we've learned a lot from what MDA did there. Uh, we're, we're incorporating all of that, and the system works. The, the architecture should work well together with the wide field of view, queuing the medium field of view, closing on an actual fire control solution. That answer that, Teresa? OK, good. All right. Sandra. Sandra Irwin, Space News, everybody. Another round of applause. Here. Good. Um, thank you, um, Derek. Uh, Sandra Irwin, Space News. I wanted to um, ask about Tranche 2. You said um, you're about to go out for proposals. Um, how many, it's a two part question. How many satellites will there be in Tranche 2? And now that you started working with a bunch of providers, you know, some of them, you know, pretty much now have won, you know, two contracts in a row. Um, how, do you, how do you envision that potentially you could select somebody else? Um, would that be disruptive if you bring another supplier by tranche two? And, and do you expect that there will be more competition at that point? Thanks. No, those are, those are good questions. And uh, I'm going to answer them in reverse order because I'm going to have to refresh my memory on the numbers while I'm, while I'm answering the question. But uh, there's, there's a profound piece to that question that I, that I have to emphasize to everybody because I think it is one of the main tenets of what we're doing at SDA that we need to get everybody on board with. And that is I am strongly opposed to any kind of vendor lock. I don't think it helps the government. I don't think it helps industry. And it's, it's just bad all around. You know, I came from, I came from uh, large aerospace and defense corporations where we won programs and that essentially gave you guaranteed employment for 15 years. If you lost the contract, you were in trouble for the next 15 years because there wouldn't be a new program. That is not good for industry, uh, and it's, uh, it, it's not, certainly not good for, for the government. So in order to combat that, what we have done is we have enforced – uh, some certain standards, and we publish these standards. Uh, one of them is uh, is completely published, uh, is completely unclassified, and it's on our website. And that is the optical communication standard. So, if you develop a, a laser communication terminal, and it matches our standard, uh, then you can feel empowered that you you can proliferate whatever's behind that. Uh, I don't care. It's a black box. There can be as much proprietary stuff in there as possible. But I know that you can tie into our network, and there's no there's no vendor lock. And in fact, we have, a, we have a, a government reference test bed set up at the Naval Research Laboratory where people can bring their optical communication terminals and demonstrate that they meet that standard. That's critically important to make sure that we do allow new entrants to come in. We will compete full and open every tranche, every layer to make sure that we keep an actual market, not, not a pseudo market. So we have the, the, the optical communication standard is one, and then the networking standard is the other. The networking standard was developed by Naval Research Laboratory, Nebula, networking enabled beyond the upper limits of the atmosphere, obviously. And uh, that one, that, that, that standard is also uh, published, but it's CUI, so we can't put that on the, on the website. But it is people that can, can look at it and, and build to that. And so those are the key things, because I want people to make sure that, that they feel empowered that this is a market. As you put business cases together, SDA is going to be investing essentially, you know, rough order of magnitude, $2 billion a year per layer, right? So $2 billion a year going into transport every year, $2 billion a year going into tracking every year. As we do more emissions, that's kind of the, that's kind of the, the cost of the service, if you will. And so that's the market. And then you make your business case based on, look, I think we'll win, I think we'll win uh, 10 percent of this market, 20 percent of this market, whatever. And then you make your internal investments accordingly. In fact, I'm counting on internal investments in industry to help push this forward. So my goal is, uh, just like the cell phone model, we will keep essentially the price of the satellites to the government essentially the same, flat. So for, for the for – the, Transport satellites, it's on the order of, you know, on the order of sub-15 million dollars is what we, we plan on, on that price being. Just like your cell phone has a certain fixed price, you know, 500, 700 dollars, whatever the cell phones run nowadays. I buy mine at the Dollar General store, so we won't talk about that. But, uh, the capabilities will continue to advance. So for that same price, every tranche 
will give you more and more capabilities for the same price. So that's kind of the, the model, just like the cell phones. Basically, the price is flat, but each new model has more and more capabilities. And so that's what I need industry to invest in. And you can, I welcome you to team with other DOD entities that are more aligned with doing R&D, such as DARPA, such as AFRL, et cetera, so that you can come up with an offering that gives you a differentiator so that you can, but you're still convinced you can deliver an operational system in two years and bid that. And put that into your business case, assuming you're going to win a certain percentage of the market share. And that's, that's kind of how I want you to view on it. Now, um, people can hear me say that, and then they can look at the data, and they can say, well, do we know we can trust that? Because on Tranche Zero transport satellites, I had two vendors. I have uh, York and Lockheed Martin on Tranche Zero, all right? And on Tranche One transport layer, I have three vendors. I have York, Lockheed Martin, and Northrop Grumman. So people can look and they say, okay, yeah, we hear you say a lot of things, but we also saw that you gave the two incumbents awards on tranche zero and tranche zero or one, so can we really believe you? I'll tell you, had we awarded two instead of three on tranche one, one of the incumbents would not have gotten an award. So it just tells you, no, just because you get a, a, an award, so uh, doesn't mean that uh, doesn't mean that you're guaranteed for the next tranche, and that's just the the way it goes. You develop offerings, offerings. We do our evaluations based on schedule number one, price number two, and then and then performance number three, which has completely changed the paradigm from where uh, you know historical DoD acquisition. And uh, one of the one of the key things that we're also incorporating is we're putting a high value on past performance. So, you know, we're, we're going to, past performance of SDA is going to take even a higher precedence. So if you do well for us, that's good. If you do poorly for us, that's, that's not good. And if you, you know, if you've essentially don't, don't have past performance, it comes in neutral is how we're, how we're going to be going. So now uh, to answer your question, to make sure I get the numbers correct on, on tranche two. So tranche two beta, first one out to shoot. It's not in here, so I'm going to make up the numbers as we go. So I believe it's 72 satellites on Tranche 2 Beta is what we're looking at. On Tranche 2 Alpha, 100. And then on Tranche 2 Gamma is 44. Those are the numbers that stick in my head. And then on the, on the tracking satellites, we have not gone through Warfighter Council on that yet. So the Warfighter Council is how we get our requirements. We went through the Tranche 2 Transport Warfighter Council, 22 March. So those requirements are blessed. That's why we're able to push forward and, and put out the solicitation next week. So those numbers, uh, you know, unless I'm, I'm misremembering, those are the numbers, 100, 72, and 44. And then uh, on the tracking satellite, since we haven't gone through Warfighter Council, can't give you this is the exact number, but it's going to be on the order of 54 is what we're, we're looking at for Tranche 2 tracking. And so the, the awards likely, you know, this is – this is TBD based on what the proposals come in, but we assume that there will be uh, three awards on beta, two awards on alpha, and two awards on gamma. All right, I think those are that's the question. So any okay, any other questions? I can't. It's hard for me to see hands, so because the lights. Somebody over there. Oh, there you are. Okay, please say your name and where you're from. Thank you. Uh, Tim Ryan with Partners in Air and Space and the other Tim Ryan, not to be confused with the Tim Ryan Mitchell. We get each other's emails all the time. So, uh, Congratulations on your tranche, uh, Zero Launch. Um, so that was, that was awesome. I had a question on uh, integration. You know, capabilities is one thing. Integrating it into the existing architecture is obviously a huge challenge. Uh, just wanted to hear your thoughts on um, have you put, you know, what thoughts you guys have put into that? Whose responsibility is it? Is that sort of pass on to SSC to integrate, or how, how is the integration into uh, the, you know, different various architectures, um, what are your plans there, and will you be ready to uh, have some capabilities for the 2026 fight? Yes. So um, we, Tranche 1 will be operationally capable for, for a fight in 2025. That's what we're, we're pushing for. Integration is... Uh, Integration is a, is, a, is a complicated but well-orchestrated dance that we're doing with the other organizations inside the Space Force. So I'll, I'll, walk, through, I'll walk through the plan. It is, uh, you know, it's not, it's not poured in concrete, but this is the, the, main, the main framework is. SDA will 
develop everything we need from our ground operation centers to all of our networking and all of the infrastructure to support, fly, operate the satellites, maintain the, the mission, maintain the, the networks, maintain the constellations, and to get those data into the existing warfighters' hands via Link 16 or via the, the joint OPAR ground and then uh, out via, via LaserCom and, and, and KA. So we will build that backbone and maintain that so that it is all operational and, and ready to go. And we will go through the standard uh, Space Force operational test and evaluation to bless that as, as operational. So is SDA going to be a warfighting operations center? No. So this is how we're, we're planning on doing it. So we will, we will own and, and operate the operations centers. An operations center for satellites is composed of three main functions. You've got mission management. Those are the folks that do, you know, the priority is, prioritization of if, you, if I have to do load shedding between network over Indo-PACOM or Link 16 network versus a, a KA network uh, versus a, a, a network over UCOM, that's mission management. And they basically take, take direction from, from Spock, who gets their prioritizations from the combatant commanders. So that's, that's, that's mission management. That's, that's the first function, the highest level function that happens at an ops center. Second is network management. Network management is making sure that actually the network is, is all green, everything's up and operational, and, and the, every, everything's working properly. Uh, the the crosslinks are talking to one another. We're passing IP data. And it's the same way that, uh, that you would have your, your IT service provider making sure your, your Internet is working. SDA is responsible for all of that. And we're going to run that on a government-owned contractor-operated model. That's what our operations and integration contractor will be responsible for. Then there's even a lower level be below that, and that's satellite operations. So those are the three parts of a network of, a, of an operation center: mission, network, and satellite operations. Satellite operations is health and status of the satellites, making sure that you know you you actually have the commands in place, and primarily it's all automated, so that if I need to point a Link 16 antenna. Uh, I, I go through the satellite, satellite has to talk to the payload, and I don't put any command in that would harm the satellite, those kind of things. That is essentially going to be all automated. That's also going to be government-owned, contractor-operated, SDA's responsibility, uh, and that will be a mixture of our operations and integration contractor and the space vehicle vendors who are on contract to be able to, to do that operations. All right, so SDA will set up that entire construct, and then what we do is when, it, when that is blessed as operational uh, through the OT&E process, then the, uh, the, folks that were the, the folks that were the uniform wear, uh, wearing uh, warfighters that were doing the mission operations will switch their badge from Space Force SDA to Space Force SPOC, and they will now be resident on the SDA op centers, but their reporting chain and authority will all run through SPOC, because they will have the functional responsibility to make sure that the prioritization of the constellation is done in conjunction with what the combatant commanders are, are giving them. So that's, that's how we have that uh, set up. And, you know, our plan is to have that all done uh, through, uh, through uh, and, and have portions of Tranche 1 operational for the fight in 2025. Uh, Lord willing, the creek don't rise. That won't happen because we'll uh, – this – capability will deter anyone from, from ever uh, attempting a threat on the U.S. hope that answers the question. Back in the back there. I'm Kohut from uh, Galt Aerospace. I'm interested in the interaction between the tranches and the commercial highly populated LEO constellations that are going up. Um, two aspects that I'd really like to hear about. Uh, are, are, is the government leveraging those capabilities like Starlink and others? And the other thing is, is what Mark Dankberg talks about a lot, is the vulnerability with putting that many satellites in a relatively small uh, orbital space. Sure, sure. Last time at this forum when the question was asked about the vulnerability of LEO satellites, I, uh, I challenged uh, – uh, Vladimir Putin to shoot something down or something. So I won't do that this time because I got some, got some press. But uh, uh, so commercial satellites, commercial constellations, there's two basic kinds. 
Right, so there's the commercial ISR providers, your electro-optical imagery providers, your star, SAR providers, you know, your radar imagery providers, and then there's your, your actual networking uh, constellations, your, your Starlinks, your, your OneWebs, your, uh, you know, future Kuipers, those kind of things. We uh, at SDA want to leverage all of the commercial ISR immediately. So the idea there would be, and we're, we're working with Capella as a, as a test case to see how they could get their data directly from their satellites onto our transport layer with the idea that that is the quickest way that we could get the data from the sensor directly down, then we could send it directly down to, to a shooter via Link 16. So that's, that's one, of the, one of the first things that, that we're working on to be able to demonstrate that. For a lot of the ISR providers, that's not possible for a couple reasons. Number one, our satellites are already on orbit, so they can't put an optical crosslink on there to talk to us, number one. And number two, you know, some of them, like Planet, they fly a lot of satellites that are, that are, that are smaller, much more affordable, and they really couldn't, couldn't host our optical crosslinks without, without changing their design significantly. For those, the plan is uh, we would go down to a ground and then, and then have some way to rapidly uh, bent pipe their data in some way up to a, a terminal that could come up and then get on our transport layer and get to the, get to the troops. For the networking side, we, uh, and this is where, where the SWAC uh, uh, Space Warfighting Analysis Cell is, uh, is working to, to come up with what the overall data transport force design for the Space Force and the DOD at large would look like. And the preview of that is we, we certainly want there to be uh, connectivity between the DOD tactical transport layer and kind of a commercial high bandwidth Data, uh, data transport backbone layers. And so the way we do that is still TBD. Likely we will have to have some kind of translator sats where we would have satellites that would have capabilities to be able to talk directly to that, that, uh, the commercial constellation and our constellation that would act as a VPN so that we could, we could make sure that we protect the cyber aspects between the two. Because the way we look at it, the, uh, if you call the internet in space the outer net, we are the SOPRNET in space, or the SIPRNET in space, right? So we're the SOPRNET. So we can't just plug back and forth a commercial uh, NIPRNET, unclassified network, to our SIPRNET and make that easy. So we have to have some kind of a VPN that allows us a trusted gateway to do that. That's where the translator stats come in. Because we know that uh, some companies have already said they are going to put optical crosslinks on their networks of satellites to talk directly to ours which is great, we encourage that, but we'll have to make sure we have some, some specific satellite set up to do that trusted, trusted uh, connectivity. So that brings me to your, your, your final question about the, the resiliency and kind of what threats we're worried about. I'll tell you, I'm not worried about any threats, physical threats to the satellites themselves. I'm just not. So the way we, we get around that is by proliferation. So we'll have hundreds and hundreds of these satellites up there it will cost more to shoot down a single satellite than it costs to build and launch th that single satellite. We've just completely changed that, uh, that equation. I just, I just that's, not, that's, not a, that's not a big threat vector. So I worry about common mode failures, right, because you can't proliferate your way out of common mode failures. The two common mode failures that I'm worried about are cyber, obviously, is a big one, which is why we want to put all of these constraints in place to protect a, a, against that. Dr. Costa here is, is you know, is, is helping, helping with that on the, on the Space Force to make sure that, you know, it all fits together in a, in a robust cyber secure architecture. And that's why we have a lot of protections and constraints in place on our contracts that, uh, you know, that aren't typical on what you would say a, a commercial commoditized procurement. Those are, we, we put some requirements in there. And then the second big com uh, common mode failure is supply chain with two threats. Uh, one is just your, your benign uh, supply chain problems that can we really build these satellites this quickly? And we're building up industry, so yes, we can. So we're kind of beating down that, that supply chain threat, that supply chain risk. The second one is more the nefarious supply chain, and that's the actual interdiction by uh, an, uh, you know, a, a nefarious actor into a supply chain. And so we actually put a lot of protections in place in our contracts so that we can, we can evaluate and make sure that we have uh, non-destructive testing in place to detect that. Because those are, those are the big threat, threats I'm worried about. Cyber, supply chain, can we actually build them in time? And then two, can we trust our supply chain? So that's what. Okay, one, one more question. 
Please make it a good one, Courtney. Hi, uh, Courtney Alvin with C4ISRNet. Um, I had a long and, and her claim to fame, she also flew out for the Thursday launch and 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 didn't see it either. <laughs> Yeah, a little anticlimactic there, but um, uh, I want to ask about launch. Um, uh, the Space Force just put out its phase, phase three R RFP for NSSL. Um, I'm curious what uh, inputs you offered, what feedback you gave as they were developing that acquisition strategy, um, and then kind of what your take is on how that shaped up, and then also, um, uh, yes, do you expect that SDA will um, primarily use the, the lane one uh, uh, part of that, or do you think that um, you'll also be able to utilize kind of the lane two element of that? Certainly. Uh, so the NSSL phase three acquisition, we actually worked uh, pretty closely with the NSSL team and, and General Purdy to, 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 to make sure our requirements were fed in based on the lessons learned that we had from, from NSSL phase two. So we bought our tranche zero launches uh, on the commercial marketplace, and then we bought our tranche one launches through the NSSL phase two. So we have, we have a really good data set on what, you know, what is a commercial launch process versus what is the NSSL launch process. And we brought those lessons learned into the NSSL team as they crafted, as they crafted phase three. So for phase three, lane one does have what SDA says, this is what, this is what we want to use to buy our, uh, to buy our launches going forward. You know, it's got uh, some, of the, some of the things with, with phase two that uh, will be fixed that the commercial industry, we didn't have that problem with the commercial launches, paying for launches two years ahead of time, making sure that they're, that's, that's something that, uh, that in phase three is, is a little different in lane one. Being able to make changes to your manifest uh, much more closely to, to the launch date than, uh, than, than what was previously allowed on phase two. Phase three, lane one will allow that. And of course, it will allow new entrants to come in, uh, demonstrate a, a launch, and then you can you can win win one of the launches. So uh, I, I do think that the phase three is is uh, organized pretty well, but I, it's in the uh, it's in the draft stage now. So please st continue to send your inputs in because the the NSSL team is generally interested in in what inputs you have. But for us, for SDA, right now we think that our requirements are well suited in in phase three, lane one. Dr. Tonier, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.